We all love Jesus, and when we study the Gospel of Matthew, we find out that his genealogy is there. Did you realize that as you go through the list of all those people, there was one woman, her name was Rahab. She was a prostitute. <laughs> My name is Father Mike Manning. God bless you. Thank you very much for tuning in. I think you're going to enjoy this program. We're trying as best we can to understand the beauty of the Bible. And how do you understand the Bible? Well, instead of being a book of all kind of strange words, one of the approaches that I find very effective is to say it's the story of people who have encountered God. And so we're reaching into these people and trying to understand them and how their encounter with God can touch us. And what we're doing right now is we're going through some very fascinating people, some women. We're going through the women of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible, and trying to understand from them, not just something that happened a long time ago, but why were they brought into the Bible and why were they something that says to you and me, this can be a way of us coming close to God. Well, I want to talk to you today about a lady whose name was Rahab, a prostitute. She lived in a town called Jericho. Now, the area around Jericho is one of the most desolate and God-forsaken places on the earth. Just to the south of the city is the Dead Sea. Now, this is where the Jordan River flows in, and there's no escape, and it loses all of its freshness. Uh, the Dead Sea is the lowest land, the lowest land place on the earth. In this, this area, Suddenly, that's all desolation, arises a fertile city. It's rich with, with wells and an oasis in the midst of desolation. Archaeologists have been able to determine that the people that have lived there for thousands of years, the oasis with its spas attracted the rich and the royalty of Israel. Jericho was the refuge of wealthy city dwellers from Jerusalem. Because of its popularity for weekends and holiday stays, it was an ideal place for a prostitute to sell her wares. Well, now let's move to another aspect that 40 years after wandering in the desert, the Hebrew people were ready to enter the promised land. <laughs> Through the years, uh, all these 40 years, they were aiming to get into that land that God had said, this will be yours. They battled, and they defeated many kingdoms on their way. And as they came to the city of Jericho, they were ready to come into the Promised Land. They had to cross the Jordan River and enter into this, this, great, this great new life for them. But the word of their success in battle reached the people of Jericho. And imagine, this is a city that's built with a wall around it, and all of this, and okay. The people were deeply frightened with the prospects of the defeat of this, this amassed army that was ready to come into them. Well, as you know, any good military planner, if you want to be successful in battle, just like the Hebrews were, they sent two men to spy on the enemy, to study their weaknesses and, their, and, and to find how they could get success. The two spies found a place to hide in the home of a prostitute. Her name was Rahab. She lived geographically and morally on the edge of society. Her house was located on the wall of the city and was strategically placed to lodge travelers. It was a prime location for her trade. Let me tell you the story of, of, of uh, Rahab now, if you kind of, after looking at that historical perspective. She was a prostitute. And she had developed a clientele of probably very wealthy and influential men. She lived at a, a, a discreet place in town. Her house was on the eastern wall of the city. And if the, the men she serviced 
didn't want to risk being seen walking in or from her house through the city, they could climb from her bedroom down the wall of the city. Ah, location, location, location. She soon, she soon, soon learned through her clients the word about, well, that an enemy army was approaching. This was not something new, but this army was known to be especially fearsome. Rumor had it that they had ravaged many towns and cities and were not known to take prisoners. The big challenge was, would the fortifications of, the, of this desired city hold up? Then one night, when, when her last client left, she discovered that two men had found the rope outside her window and had come into her house. <laughs> she, knew, she knew how to handle men, even unannounced visitors. She learned that they were spies from the approaching enemy. Well, it didn't take her long to devise a solution to a potentially serious problem. She agreed to support them in any way she could. She gave them the layout of the town, uh, including its weaknesses and strengths. She agreed to hide them. In return, all she asked was for safety for her, her children, her family. The spies agreed. But as the two spies moved through the city, they were detected. They returned as fast as they could, running to Rahab's home to hide. And when the police came asking that she turn over the two spies, Rahab said um, they had escaped down the wall of the city using the rope to get away through her bedroom. Well, when the Chosen People's army invaded, ooh, they came with great force. They spared Rahab and her family. A red cloth was hung in her window to let the soldiers know where this valuable spy lived. I like that story very much, and it speaks to you and me in some, well, important ways. Again, what's the Bible about? The Bible is about, about people who have encountered God, and in a marvelous way, uh, this Rahab, who, as we know, actually becomes part of the lineage of Jesus, was a significant person. Let's see what we can relate. I, I, I thought, well, what, what in heaven's name does she say to you and to me? Let's look at the reality of, of prostitutes, prostitutes in our world. Prostitutes speak of a man or woman's strong sexual drive, being satisfied in contrast to abstinence and sexual fulfillment in marriage with responsibility. Often prostitutes have sex, not only for the physical satisfaction, but also as a means of financial income. Sometimes, prostitutes and their clients justify their actions as a way of enhancing a marriage commitment. The goal of a man and a woman's sexual desire in marriage is a committed union of love. The intimacy of sexuality enhances that love, um, including egg and sperm, which are, which are a gift from God for creating children. The reality of prostitutes and the possibility of men and women choosing them clarifies through contrast the Christian challenge of choosing a committed, nurturing relationship in marriage or friendship in celibacy. Jesus has an interesting and even surprising genealogy. There's Ruth, who is not a Jew, Bathsheba, uh, who commits adultery with King David, and then Rahab, who's a prostitute. Well, then during his public life, he had a special ministry with prostitutes. Jesus was not one to associate solely with religious and socially acceptable people. His critics accused him of hanging around prostitutes too much. Jesus irked his opponents by saying, get this, prostitutes were entering the kingdom of heaven quicker than they were. 
when we talk about this relationship with prostitutes, there's never a question of Jesus having sexual favors with these women. But he was always on the edge of coming and seeing something in them that nobody else saw, something that allowed them to be able to understand their greatness in contrast to the, oh, the lascivious looks of the men who were trying to, to get them for their own satisfaction. Although adultery and fornication is wrong, I wonder if Jesus considered prostitutes more honest than those who hid their sexual aberrations and frustrations with the mask of righteousness and religiosity. Prostitutes enter into our life with a real challenge. It's not something that we can say, oh, well, it's only something that happened then. It's our reality now. And we, as followers of Jesus, speak of a contrast with purity and goodness and health. Stay tuned, I'm gonna be right back. But I wanna share with you some more insights into how this lady, this prostitute, can even speak to us today and help us to be better Christians. Pardon my Lenten smile. What do you mean smile? Our understanding is that Lent is a somber time of negation and sacrifice. We hear the echoing words of John the Baptist calling out in the desert, Repent! We see the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus in the wilderness and being tested by the devil at the end. In the midst of these gloomy prospects of the 40 days of Lent, Pardon My Lenten Smile, written by Father Mike Manning, offers you some hope. Yes, this offers you a Lenten smile. Don't be gloomy, because the Lord says, When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They neglect their appearance so that they may appear to others to be fasting. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not appear to be fasting except your heavenly Father who is hidden. And your heavenly Father who sees what is hidden will repay you. Do you want this Lent to be different? Pardon My Lenten Smile offers you the way to do this. Each day there is a quote from the day's scripture readings and a short reflection applying it to your everyday life. Filled with practical advice on how to live each day and make this Lent meaningful, it ends with a short and sincere prayer that you can call your own. By Easter, you will have a closer relationship with God. Father Mike Manning's book, Pardon My Lenten Smile, is going to put a smile on every face this Lent as we experience the Lord alive, coming out of the tomb. We have got to smile, and that smile is to hang around on every face, every heart, and every soul for a long time. Get this book and bring a smile to your face and to the faces of everyone you love this Lent for your gift of $15 or more. Call the number on the screen. Get it today. We're talking about Rahab, a, a fascinating lady in the Bible, one of the persons who's part of the genealogy of Jesus, uh, part of his family line. She was a prostitute, but a prostitute who was able to, in many ways, open the door for allowing the Jewish people to come into the promised land, the land that they'd wandered in the desert for 40 years waiting to get to, and she opened the door for allowing them to be able to continue. And, and have their presence in the land that God had promised. But as we, as we look at the story of Rahab, the important thing is not just to see her as a person 2,000 years ago, but something today. And so I've spoken to you about well, prostitution and it's present in our, our lives and how do we deal with that and how can we as Christians be a, a source of contrast to that way. But there's another interesting thought about Rahab and it's this, Rahab faced the invasion of, of the Jews into her country. We invade the lives of others through, well, through our commercialism, you know, our cars, through the, the fancy ways we try to sell things. What about the media, uh, the movies, the television, um, the songs that are sung? You know? So many times you can go around and you can find that the name of a 
of a star in, in, in our media is something that maybe in a very poor part of Africa or Asia that you, know, you wouldn't think of, oh, that's their, that's their idol, that's the person that they're really trying to imitate and, and come close to. There's also this invasion that happens with the military. In many ways, we in the United States are concerned about injustice that happens around the world, and so we have military forces going into Iraq and Afghanistan and other places around the world. We're, we're invading, if you will, into that. But there's another dimension to that and this invasion, and that's the invasion of religion. I'm a member of a community of missionaries. Our, my whole life is set on loving Jesus deeply in my heart and wanting to bring that love of Jesus to many people. That's what this television ministry is all about, trying to get into the hearts of people, not only those that know Jesus and love Him and are going to church, but maybe someone of you is just kind of passing by, curiously wondering what this priest is doing, talking about the Bible and talking about a prostitute. And I'm hoping that maybe I'm, if you will, I could invade your life, if I, if I may, to try to bring Christ into that. So you see the connection that I'm making with Rahab, who's concerned about this invasion of people coming into their lives. And you and I, well, we, in many ways, we're invading the lives of other people. Each of us as a Christian, we're called to enter in, to invade in the lives of, of others and, and bring them Jesus. We're missionaries, not, not just me with a missionary order, but each of us who have been baptized have been commissioned by Christ to, to go around and baptize, go around to all people in the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Given our love of freedom and our desire to afford that freedom to everyone, the question arises, and this is important for us to ask, what right do we have to try to enter into the lives of other people? Well, we can ask that on the level of, of uh, being, uh, being the commercialism. We can ask that on the level of the military or the entertainment world. But also the question of religion. Um, what right do I have to come into a, a culture and a people that have been living in that way for a long time? What right do I have to come in and try to invade them, if you will, with my experience of Christ? What right do I have to take, to take something that people have held and change that, if you will? The only motivation or rationale for being so bold as to, as to do something like that is that it becomes an act of love. We, we, share, we share an experience of forgiveness and acceptance and promise by God and we want to bring that good news to people we meet. We offer the good news to others by our words, by our actions, and by our love. Well, the important thing is we don't force anybody. <laughs> people are free to accept or reject us. After all, God is the source of, of, of all that gift of faith. If, if, if one is not <laughs> convinced personally of the power of love and that relationship with Jesus, then being a missionary, being someone who invades the life of other people, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, it would be a situation of grave embarrassment. <laughs> but if, on the other hand, our hearts are burning with that love for Jesus and also a love for others, taking the risk of invading another to know Jesus, it makes sense. There's a place for moving into the life of another if done in love and respecting freedom. Missionaries will go out and call people from all over the world to come to glorify God. And how do they do that? Uh, here, let, me, let me give you some, some thoughts, just some points. Number one, if you want to be a good missionary entering into love, number one, you get to know and you love the people uh, who don't know Jesus. And that means you just you, you sit with them, you listen to them, you breathe with them, you, you work with them. 
and you allow them to become someone that you really know, number one. You know, so you, you get to know and love the people. Number two, you're able to find God in them. Now, I believe that God loves all people, and I think that's an important statement to make. It's not exclusively on this side or that side or this religion or whatnot. God loves everyone. And if you have that perspective, when you come into a person's life, you know that God has moved through them and talked to them and lived with them. And what you do is, with a great sense of openness, you come and say, hey, <laughs> I, want to know, I want to know God through what God has done in your life. Boom, number two. You search for that presence of God. Not judgmental and not condemning, but hungry to understand how, how God has shown his love into their lives. And number three, we then very humbly, when the occasion comes, share our experience of God. We don't have to be people that know chapter and verse of everything of the Bible. Sometimes that can be daunting. But we do know how we have experienced God in our life. And all we have to do is tell how God has moved and changed our life. Hmm. It's a simple project but it's one that I encourage you to think about if you would like to be that missionary. Could you maybe put in 100 words or maybe 150 words your experience of God in your life and then be willing to share that with others? And then the last point is, well, you have to admit the fact that you don't have to be overly concerned if the results are not exactly what you want. God is the source that brings faith, and all you got to do is be as loving and kind to the people you're with, and then just stand back and let God do his great thing. What a wonderful thing to think about, though, huh? Yeah. Well, now there's, there's one last thing I want to share with, and that's, that's this whole thing of spying. I and mean, we've got spies coming into Rahab's room and, you know, and, and are living in her house and whatnot, and they're the ones that are overcoming us. You know? And spying is one of the, the most effective ways of winning a war a man or a woman is sent in to, to be with the enemy. Their, their goal is to get to know the leaders. Uh, uh, they're to ascertain the size and placement and movement of troops. In general terms, uh, a, a spy's job is to learn and reveal the enemy's strengths and weaknesses. A spy puts his or her life on the line. <laughs> For if caught, the ordinary punishment is execution. Yeah. Soon after, leaving the slavery of Egypt, Moses sent 12 men into the promised land of spies. Yeah. During the American Revolution, Benedict Arnold became a spy for the British. Today, along with men and women working in enemy territory, spying is done electronically. In the Second World War, the U.S. intelligence was able to break the secret codes of the Japanese and know their in movement and, and, and their attacks. Today, the U.S. government has developed a, a far-reaching ability to capture phone messages and emails with the goal of combating terrorism. As people of faith, we must face the fact <laughs> that God knows us and is present to all we think and do. In many ways, God is spying on us. <laughs> we can approach this reality from two ways. At the first, we can be filled with fear. You know, there, there's no escaping God. He knows our sins and failings and all the information he needs to condemn us. But on the other hand, God's presence in Jesus is filled with love, encouragement, and forgiveness. Rather than find ways of, to infiltrate us and condemn us, in the Gospel of John we read, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And God, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, intercedes and prays for us. Wow, what a wonderful experience of God. Please, stay tuned. We're going to wrestle with some challenging questions and also have a chance to pray for some of your special intentions. God bless. Pardon my Lenten smile. Our understanding is that Lent is a somber time of negation and sacrifice. 
We hear the echoing words of John the Baptist calling out in the desert, repent. We see the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus in the wilderness and being tested by the devil at the end, in the midst of these gloomy prospects of the 40 days of Lent. Pardon My Lenten Smile, written by Father Mike Manning, offers you some hope. Yes, this offers you a Lenten smile. Each day there is a quote from the day's scripture readings and a short reflection applying it to your everyday life. Filled with practical advice on how to live each day and make this Lent meaningful, it ends with a short and sincere prayer that you can call your own. By Easter, you will have a closer relationship with God. Get this book and bring a smile to your face and to the faces of everyone you love this Lent for your gift of $15 or more. Call the number on the screen. Get it today. The heart of the ministry is the beauty of knowing that you are, are in touch, you're watching, but also you're responding. And I please, I invite you, pick up your phone and, and give a call. Let us know some of the struggles that are going on in your life because we want to pray for you. But also as we are asking for you to, to share some of your, your struggles, would you also share some of your victories? You need to hear the other side of it, the things that God has blessed you and for which you're really full of thanks for the goodness of what had happened. You know? But I'm going to invite you now, would you, would you join with us and, and uh, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for some special people around the country who have taken the time to call and to email. And remember, uh, you can always stay in touch with us with our, with our app on the iPhone. It's called iGod Today. That's for Apple, it's for Android, it's for Windows, and it's free, and you can get there. You know? Please, give it a look. But now, we got, let, let's put on our, our prayer caps, if we, if we will. Would you remember Bertha from Alabama? She's asking for her, her son who is in prison, asking for help, bringing back a new life. Blanca in Texas, um, she's praying for healing for her daughter and also for a job. Uh, Mamie in Virginia, she needs a healing for her hip. Uh, Kimberly in Alaska, in this great, we're getting it from Alaska. Uh, our friends Bill and Alan uh, are in a hospital and they have a terrible uh, a breathing issue. Sylvia from Alabama, um, her divorce after 11 years, and she doesn't feel it's her fault, but she's really struggling. Lord, we need your help. <laughs> we need your love. Heal us, bless us. May Jesus' love for you always make you smile.